I served in Vietnam. And what branch of service? Uh, Army. What was your highest rank? E4. In what general locations did you serve? Uh, generally, the Central Coastal Plains, which was about the right about the center of South Vietnam on the coast. Um, but I served in several places, so it wasn't just one place. I served in um, Phu Yen Province, Binh Dinh Province, uh, as far south as the um, Saigon area. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? At the time, I was living in Springfield, Massachusetts, but I enlisted through the uh, uh, local board in New Haven, which is my hometown where I was born. Do you recall the date? It was September 29th or 30th, 1966. And why did you join? Well, all my friends were going, and um, there was a group that was leaving it uh, or joining at a certain time. So I just kind of hooked up with some buddies and we knew we were going anyway, so. Why did you pick the Army? Um, I was more enamored with the Army than with the other branches like the Navy or the Air Force or the Marines. My father was in the Navy. Um, I had other family. My great grandfather and uh, my paternal grandfather were in, uh, served in the army. And I also had family that uh, served in the Civil War with the 29th Connecticut Volunteers. Tell me about your first days in service. Um, those were the uh, most exciting days and the most, I would say, strange days. Because you didn't know what was going to happen next. But the, it was exciting because you were with a bunch of your peers and everybody was in the same boat. So you were kind of looking forward to it. And at the same time, it was an adventure. How did it feel? <clears throat> when I think back on it, it, it was a very exciting and strange feeling at the same time. Um, it's hard to put a word to it. It's like nothing I'd ever experienced. All right, tell me about your boot camp and your training experiences. Okay, in the Army we call it basic training. Boot camp is Marines, Marine Corps, they call it boot camp. But in basic training, um, first we were at the um, reception station. And that's where you get all your equipment and um, after you get your shots. And then a couple of days, then a day or so after that, you meet your drill sergeant and find out where you're going to be assigned for your uh, basic training. But upon meeting a drill sergeant, he initiates you immediately into um, the rigors of basic training by yelling at you, calling you dirty names, and having you do all kind of crazy exercises. Do you remember any of your instructors? Oh, yeah. My uh, drill instructor's name was... Sergeant Williams. I believe his first name was Clarence. Don't call him Clarence. How did you get through it? Um, to me, basic training was uh, the most fun. Everything was new. Um, the food was great in basic training. Make no mistake about that. Um, you know, learning how to use a, a rifle and training with different weapons. Um, you know, putting on the uniform and performing your exercises and drilling. You know, it was new and it was exciting because you were, you felt like you were part of something, part of a team. After boot camp, where'd you go? Basic training. <laughs> After basic training, where did you go? Um, I did basic in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And we had um, advanced infantry training in Fort Knox. And from there, I went to Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood, Texas was where I was assigned to my unit that would eventually deploy for Vietnam. And it was an aviation company, the 268th Aviation Battalion. And we trained at West Fort Hood at a place called Gray Army Airfield. 
What were your first experiences when you arrived there? In Fort Hood, um, it was February 1967, and it was rather warm for uh, right in the middle of winter time. I believe it must have been about 75 degrees that day. And um, I thought it was going to be like that every day, but it wasn't. It got cold. Then where'd you go, and what did you do? Okay, from um, Fort Hood, Texas, we trained uh, in um, aviation tactics and um, general unit um, missions, uh, learning who the chain of command and uh, what different platoons were responsible for what part of the mission. We had a Pathfinders platoon. Uh, they were... Uh, primarily in, engaged with security and uh, when we would actually become um, f a functional unit they would uh, be assigned stuff like clearing LZs um, and security for the helicopters landing and, and taking off in, in an LZ stuff like that. Describe a typical, typical day for you in the service. Oh, uh, well, in the early part, is the first thing is um, reveille in the morning. You wake up very early. Uh, you get dressed. Uh, you wash your face, brush your teeth, get dressed, go outside uh, for reveille. Uh, you blow the bugle and play the Star Spangled Banner and all that. And most of the time, it's still dark. Um, but that's in the early parts of training and whatnot. Later, it gets a little bit... Uh, more regimented and uh, task oriented rather than the general um, training and orientation. In what way? Um, you're, you're assigned to a unit and you have a job rather than you're in training and you're being conditioned to military way of life. So Reveille was a, a bigger part of the training than it was later on in, in your um, military career. Did you see any combat? Yes. Where at? Um, in Vietnam with the 129th Assault Helicopter Company. Uh, initially, upon arrival in Vietnam, we arrived as a group with uh, the 268th Combat Aviation Battalion, whom I trained with in Fort Hood. Um, initially, we were um, our duties were building up the unit. We didn't have an airfield. We laid the, uh, the airfield. Uh, the engineers came and leveled the ground. But we went out and laid down the, the steel plating that would cover the dirt for the uh, uh, helicopters to land on. And in some cases, um, we had um, a Mohawk company nearby, and they were twin engine airplanes. So we had to lay the, um, what they call perforated steel plating. Did you see any casualty while you were there? Um, when I was, uh, we, our first casualties was with the uh, 268th Aviation Battalion, Combat Aviation Battalion. We had a, a mid-air collision uh, with our helicopters. We had two choppers out on practice gun runs collide and with a mid-air collision and we suffered eight killed in action and um, we had a detail that was assigned to go out and police up the bodies. Did you know any of them? Uh, one was a good friend of mine. His name was Douglas R. Noel from Salisbury, North Carolina. He was with the Pathfinder Detachment. He was a good, good man. So you were, you were in the uh, Tet Offensive? Tell me about that. Uh, during Tet, I was not with my unit. I was temporarily assigned um, down in uh, Long Bend, in the Long Bend area. And um, my biggest memory of that was that um, we couldn't get out to go back to our unit. So we were kind of stuck in the middle of uh, a lot of stuff that was going on down there. And uh, I was very close to uh, the Ordnance Battalion ammunition dump which um, Viet Cong blew up 
And before that, I had been in the dump, so I knew the lay of the land as far as the dump was concerned. And um, after it was blown up and it burned for like two weeks straight, at least two weeks, it, it looked like an atomic bomb had gone off and it just continually burned. Ordnance was exploding and cooking off for, for weeks. And um, after it had burned out, well, uh, we were again assigned to go in the dump, only this time it was we were to go in and um, basically police up um, any bodies that were there and um, mark where there was any unexploded ordinance, which there wasn't too much. Can you tell me about the casualties over there? Um, we didn't, my particular group, we didn't suffer any casualties, but we saw a lot of casualties. Part of our uh, duties were, they weren't necessary to, uh, necessarily um, duties that you were assigned to, but it was an emergency thing and they needed people to help out at the 24th um, Evacuation Hospital in Long Bend. And um, choppers were coming in at a furious rate with uh, wounded and there was a lot of blood and guts all over the place. Um, we had to clear out and clean up a lot of the uh, horror, as you might call it. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something that they had personnel to do on a regular basis. But, because um, this was extraordinary um, circumstances. Could you tell me about the fires? The fires at the uh, ammo Well, the fires at the ammo there wasn't one fire. It was like a huge ball of flame. It looked like a piece of the sun had landed on Earth. Um, you could see it miles away on the horizon. It was just a dome of fire, like a red glow at night. And, um, the first week or so, the first week it was like white hot and then it uh, gradually reduced to yellow and then red um, and eventually it died out but um, it burned as I said for weeks I thought it, it seemed like forever but it burned for two weeks and you could actually see ordnance flying through the air uh, as it would cook off you know it's like a uh, Solar flares, almost. It looked like. And the casualties from that? Um, no, but they, they were they were considerable in the area. But the ammo dump itself, um, there were personnel that would guard the perimeter of the ammo dump, and I don't know how many personnel uh, that were assigned there um, actually um, were casualties. That part is unknown to me, but um. You have to have um, an idea, since so much explosive ordnance is stored in one spot, you have to have a lot of room around it in case something happens that it wouldn't immediately impact the surrounding area where that is populated. So when you get to the ammo dump, before you get there, there's an area that's like very sparsely kind of populated, but it's in the middle of our area, so it's not like they can just sneak in, which they did anyway. So, um, you have an area around it, I guess they would call it a berm, and then within the ammo dump itself, you, it took us like 45 minutes uh, getting into uh, the center by truck. So I imagine it had to be some miles inside before you got to the area where you had ammunition stored. And as I recall from being in there before, the explosion, uh, where they had pallets of uh, ammunition for 105 howitzers, powder charges, and very volatile stuff. All it would take it would be a spark to set that stuff off. And what were your thoughts and feelings at the time? Well, we were pretty much um, excited to be there and see all of this. But we did have the realization that, you know, be careful because a lot of guys smoked and, um, you know, don't smoke around this stuff, which we didn't. You know, the guys were pretty um, cognizant of where they were. 
any other areas you were stationed at? Um, uh, it, when I was with the 129th Assault Helicopter Company, our assignment was to um, support the Republic of Korea Tiger Division. Their official name is the Capital Division, but they wore a patch. They had a tiger's head on it. So their nickname was the Tiger Division. And um, we were in direct support of them for the timelines with the 129th. Although, you know, our responsibilities weren't just to them, but that was our primary um, assignment. Do you have any stories from when you were there? Uh, the Koreans made life kind of easy for us because um, they were very hardcore soldiers. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, we had unit citations. I wasn't awarded anything special other than um, um, the defense ribbons and Vietnam service medals. I was eligible for an uh, air medal, although I saw I didn't, didn't see where I received one because I did fly as a door gunner. I contacted um, my crew chief. He lives in California. And amazingly, he doesn't remember me. But we trained together in Fort Knox. We deployed together. We were together with the 268th Combat Aviation Battalion. We had to build that uh, unit up from the ground. Um, and we worked together doing that. And we were buddies for a while. And so I don't know. Um, he could be suffering from anything, um, PTSD or maybe some sort of dementia or where his memory is impaired. I don't know. But I, I was kind of surprised that he didn't remember me because I was trying to get some documentation of my um, time with the 129th serving as and flying as a door gunner. Did you sustain any injuries? Um, no, I didn't. How did you stay in touch with your family when you were away? Mail. Right. We didn't have um, cell phones like today. They did have, I think they called it the Mars unit. It was some type of satellite uh, thing where you could call home. But that was generally for emergency type stuff. And what was the food like? In Vietnam, the food was pretty bad. Powdered eggs uh, for breakfast and stuff like that. Uh, uh, the bread had bugs in it, um, what they call weevils. Uh, the cereal uh, had weevils in it, and you would use this horrible re uh, powdered milk. Later on, it got a little bit better, and you had reconstituted milk, which the chocolate was very good. Um, but the cereal, generally, we didn't eat that. Did you have, have enough supplies? Um, sometime we would be short on the different different things, but we always managed to have have what we needed, especially ammunition. Um, and then we had scrounging missions where, um, for the luxury of the, the officers, we would go out and scrounge stuff like air conditioners and refrigerators. Did you feel any pressure or stress when you were over there? Um, sure. Um. When we first arrived was when there was the most, because everything was new, uh, and your first introduction was the heat of the country, which was, as soon as they opened the door on the airplane, we went over in a jet, uh, um, um, Air Force C-141 Star Lifter, and as soon as they opened the door, it seemed like all the cool refrigerated um, air conditioning was sucked out and replaced with this heavy, humid, uh, hyperheat. It was hotter than anything I had experienced to that point. It literally took your breath away, and you were, and your clothes automatically stuck to your body. It was extremely hot, and it took some while to get used used to. The first days it was intolerable. Was there something that you carried for good luck? No, I didn't have any superstitions like that. And how did you entertain yourself? We had music, and um, periodically we would be able to go into uh, a nearby city for what they call um, not rest and recreation because that was a more formal thing where you could leave the country 
and go to places like Hong Kong or in country R and I where you could go to places like Vong Tao um, for um, a week or two. But um, generally, we we could go out to a nearby city and buy souvenirs and things like that, or eat at a restaurant. Um, but most of our entertaining, we entertained ourselves, unless we had a troop that would come in for entertaining. Like uh, sometimes we had uh, bands that would come in from Korea, you know, Korean bands or Vietnamese bands where the Vietnamese girls would dress up like go roll girls and they would play rock and roll and it was it was fun did you go on leave anywhere? um R&R &R. and I went to um Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia what did you do there? just hang out for a couple of weeks in uh, Hong Kong because I was uh, there for 18 months straight, so I had two R&Rs. Do you recall anything particularly humorous or unusual? Well, everybody was funny because we had a great group of guys. Um, some of them I s still have contact with, although they live um, you know, halfway across the country. Um, it was just, you know, we played music together and uh, drank beer and Corrals, you know, when we had the time. Were there any pranks that you would pull on each other? Um, there was one guy. He had a monkey that would terrorize everybody. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of the monkey on, on um, our unit website. And uh, it was kind of interesting to see people that I knew like Douglas Arnold, the guy that I mentioned who was killed, see his picture after so many years. Uh, some of the other guys, uh, and the monkey, which I didn't like that monkey. I still, I don't like monkeys. But um, uh, me and the guy that owned the monkey, we would like have these uh, mock fights. And um, it was funny because the, the Koreans saw us doing this and they thought it was very entertaining. And so they invited us to come and train in Taekwondo. With their, with their troops. And uh, we did that for a while. So I had um, some training in martial arts. That was my first introduction to martial arts was with um, the Koreans. Have you kept up with it? Uh, off and on over the years, much long, much uh, long, you know, in the past. So what did you think of the officers and your fellow soldiers? We had good and we had bad. Some of the guys, most of the, most of the enlisted men were okay. Um, because we were all in it together and we were peers more or less. Um, there were some that were a little bit, you know, maybe thought they were above everyone else. You know, I mean, you're always going to have that. But for the most part, you know, we all got along. Uh, we'd have fights and stuff like that from time to time, but it was no big deal. Um, the NCOs, some of them were good, some were bad. The officers, some were good, some were bad. Um, I'd like to name a couple of them that were good. With the 129th, we had a major who was excellent example of what a commanding officer should be. His name is Major Emery. I forget his first name, but his name was Emery. Major Emery, E-M-O-R-Y. And he was really good. We had a first sergeant that was exceptional with the 129th. I can't remember his name at all, but I had a captured AK-47. And when I left, I gave it to him. He wanted me to he wanted me to accept money for it, but I, I couldn't. I said, nah, this is for you. And you know, he was kind of touched by that. You know, you don't have many first sergeants that you feel that good about. <laughs> Did you keep any kind of journal? No, I didn't. I did take a lot of photographs. Unfortunately, I have very few of them left. Um, my cousins had some and they're gone. My wife had some and she let them go. Um, when I say let them go, she just lost track of them and they're gone. Um, I mailed a whole crate load of film and negatives and photographs to myself and they never arrived. Uh, someone told me that I could investigate they might be in a dead letter office. I've been kind of hesitant to do that because I feel like they're not there. But 
I remember they were mailed to Torrington, Connecticut, because I mailed them to my dad, and I, I thought I had the correct address, but it was a wrong address. And then I don't even know if the, if the package was mailed, because I left it with the mail room for them to mail. So I don't, I can't say for certain that they um, did it, that they mailed the package. But if they did, that's where it would have been sent to a wrong address. You had told me a story of a, a typhoon. Oh yeah, that was um, June 1967. We hadn't, we'd been there maybe a little over a month. And a huge storm came in. Um, it lasted um, over a day. It was a tremendous storm. It swept in from, I believe, the north east and just came down and across the country from north to south and um, north to south and a little bit west and the storm was so powerful that um, it blew roofs off the buildings it was um, we had corrugated tin or metal roofs and it blew the, the, the metal off and we were asleep trying to sleep through this noise uh, and it was tremendous and we woke up to find ourselves wet with no roof. And it was dangerous because if anyone was outside, this flying metal would, it could have easily cut people in half or decapitated people. So um, by the time we, um, the storm was passed uh, and we were able to go out and about, um, there was some strange phenomenon like um, we, the area we were in was mostly sand. This is when I was still with the 268th in uh, Fuhip in Fuyin province. Uh, we were very close to the South China Sea. We could actually walk to the beach. And um, the sand, you'd be walking and all of a sudden you'd find yourself almost up to your waist in water because the sand would, was light and it would float on top of the water. So, um, and you would sink down to your calves in water, but you were walking through sand. So that was kind of um, an adventure. And we walked down to the beach to uh, observe the waves. And um, it was scary to watch these waves coming in after the storm because they were way above our heads. It must have been like 20 feet or more. And the waves were standing back from a distance. We were on a small bluff, and the beach was below us. And you could see the waves come in, and they would roll like the sea would just roll, and then it would crest and break and when it would break there was this tremendous noise um like you see in films but i've never experienced anything like that um before or since uh, tell me where were you when you were your service ended uh for hamilton new york in brooklyn can you, can you tell me about that day about being discharged um, being stationed in Brooklyn was kind of exciting in itself. Fort Hamilton is right across from the Statue of Liberty. The horizontal bridge, the horizontal narrows bridge, that big suspension bridge, would be to your, uh, to our right. And as we would look across, we could see this island where there was the um, Statue of Liberty. And it was kind of exciting to every day just have that for a view. That was the main thing I remember about Fort Hamilton. And plus, getting on the subway and riding into Manhattan or Brooklyn. Um, I had met a girl in Brooklyn and she invited me to visit her and I went to visit her. She lived in, I think it was Fort Greene. It was somewhere at the, Bed the Bedford-Stuyvesant area of um, Brooklyn. And um, these big, big projects. And uh, I went to see her and I was looking for her name on the mailbox. And I saw my friend's name from uh, Vietnam. From we went over together from um, uh, Fort Hood. His name was Chester Simpkins, and I said, uh, "Chester R. Simpkins." What are the odds that that's not him? So I rang the bell, and um, his mother was there, and I went up to his floor, and he wasn't there, and. Uh, she, she invited me in and she pointed to a picture on the wall, is that? And it was him. So I waited for him to come home. I called my, the girl that I was supposed to be visiting and told her 
what was going on. She said, well, you go see your friend. I know you want to see your friend from Vietnam. And she was real good about it. I never did get to see her again. <laughs> so um, I saw my buddy, and it was like a great reunion. Um, it, was kind of, it was very unexpected and what do you call it? serendipitous, you know going to do one thing and then this other great thing happens so I spent some time visiting him and um and one thing I recall walking around the neighborhood in Brooklyn we went to see some friends of his in uh, another part of the neighborhood and it looked like a war zone uh, there were there was house after house that was abandoned and boarded up um it was very spooky very spooky. Um, and then uh, in the middle of all this, there was uh, they were like browns. They weren't brownstones. They were like row houses, similar to brownstones. They might have, some of them might have been brownstones. I know there's a very formal um, criteria for what is a brownstone. You have one building that looks like a brownstone, but it's not. So I hesitate to call all of them brownstones. But um, and it was at night and. All these dark houses, and then there's one, and you see lights on. And we went there, and some friends, and it was very nice inside. But the area looked desolate, and it looked like a, a, a bombed-out war zone, or urban war zone. It was kind of scary. But that was Brooklyn in 1970. Um, what was your homecoming like? No one expected me uh, coming home because I didn't tell anybody. Um, when I came back from Vietnam, that is. As a matter of fact, they didn't know when I was getting out because that was, I didn't tell anybody when I was getting out either. Um, I, I do know when I left Vietnam to come home, I kind of was reluctant to leave. And it was kind of strange that um, all of a sudden I didn't want to go home. And I, I, I didn't quite get over that feeling. Even today, I think about it. Um, what it was that made me feel like I wanted to stay, in which, at this point in time, I want to return. But um, my homecoming, um, my sisters, my mother, they were all there, and um, they were excited to see me because, like I said, they didn't expect me. What did you do in the days to weeks afterwards when you got home? Um, I went around looking up people, um, old girlfriends. Um, uh, one girl that uh, I was going out with, and I told you I lived in Springfield before. I, so I went back to Springfield and uh, went out. We went out and um, then on New Year's Eve, um, I wasn't with her on New Year's Eve. I was supposed to be up there, but I didn't go. And she was killed in an automobile accident on New Year's Eve, 1968, going into 69. And um, afterwards, I ensued later on, I think it was in mm, September 69, when I went back to uh, Springfield for a visit. I went by her house to visit her because I had found out from someone else that I didn't even know that she had been killed. So hoping against hope, I went by her house to see her not wanting to believe that she was dead. And when I went by there, her parents said, I'm sorry, but um, she's not with us anymore. And they told me what happened. And I was trying to act like I was shocked, but I already knew, but I just didn't want to believe it. And, you know, I just saw her picture on the mantle. And um, it was kind of strange because um, after that, her... Um, her brother went out with me for a ride. We rode around for about three or four hours. And all we did was ride around, and it was crazy. I, I think I was kind of like out of it because I was doing crazy stuff. Not driving crazy, but it was just a very strange evening. Very strange evening. Her name was um, Debbie Blackwell. And it felt kind of, I think one of the things that I felt when I went into her, her home and I saw her parents was that here I was coming back from Vietnam to see her and there she was gone, you know, and I felt kind of guilty about that, I think, you know, so. When you 
came back, did you go to work or go to school? When I, when I got out the uh, military, I, I went to work. I worked um, in New Haven as a probation aide. I was like a probation officer for juveniles. And that was kind of exciting because um, I knew what the juvenile place looked like because I had a visit there once when I was 15. <laughs> Did you make any close friendships when you were in the service? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, some of the people I still think about. Do you see any of them? Hardly. Hardly. I've tried to look up some. I've successfully looked up uh, and contacted a couple, but for the most part, it's been very difficult. Irony of ironies. When I first came to CCSU back in 1999, there was a kid here from Union, New Jersey. And one of our guys, his name was Pete Vitale, was from Union, New Jersey, and he had a brother named Joe. And um, there was a student here, as I said, from Union, and I asked him, I said, you know any Vitales? And he said, oh, yeah. And um, he named some of them. I said, was there one named Pete? And he said, um, yeah, no, Joe and Pete. And so I, I, I said, well, it couldn't be the same Pete. He said, no, he, he was a junior because his father had served in Vietnam. And I said, what are the odds that it's not him? You know, zero to none. You know, it had to be him. Did you get in contact with him? No, I tried, but I couldn't uh, find his address or phone number. Um, what did you do when you were in the military? I worked um, in Texas as a, not a social worker, but I was a case, in case management. I, had, I did not have a degree to be a social worker, so I couldn't call myself a social worker, though I had pretty much the same task as social worker. How did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of tough because there was a, a moment in time when I was in Vietnam that I felt like a sucker. You know, I, I thought, I said, here we are, just some kids that they take and put you in the army, you know, if you're drafted or you and this, and they train you and teach you how to shoot and kill, and you go off and you fight some other guys that have done the same thing, and you don't even know each other. You know, and, and it seemed like really stupid. You know, I'm sure that there's... You know, people justify, so well, you serve in your country, and there's bad people in the world, and this, that, the other world, those guys think that we're bad. You know, so, I don't see, the, you know, the, it's kind of crazy. And I, I couldn't get over that, and I still feel that it's, it's stupid and crazy. And the bottom line is that human beings must be stupid and crazy. Join any veterans organization? Um, no, but I think I, I'm going to be involved with the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars because, as I understand, the older people are like leaving and the new people need to take over and keep it going. Just like the guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, well, the Vietnam veterans are starting to die out, and just like the World War II vets. You know, I had a good friend um, that I didn't even find out till after he passed. His name was Hal Danks, and he was, he served in World War II with the 101st Airborne and had parachuted behind enemy lines on D-Day. He's mentioned in the book called uh, Rendezvous with Destiny. Rendezvous with Destiny is a uh, history of the 101st Airborne. He's they mentioned him by name in in the book. And I have a photograph with him. I was, did I like to get to his um, family? And uh, I have a photograph of him and a, a Marine that was known as the Fighting Marine, who went by, um, he was a former heavyweight contender by the name of Ken Norton. Have you ever heard of him? He broke Muhammad Ali's jaw. So I have a picture of myself with him and a picture of Hal Danks with him that I'm trying to find to his family so I can get him that picture. And I was also wondering if um, that picture could be submitted for him for the Veterans History Project. We'll check. Uh, do you attend any reunions 
for any of your... No. I, once I found my unit on um, online, I'm in contact with, with them, and they had some reunions, but I found them after the fact. How did your service and your experiences affect your life? Um, when I came back, I was up and down, up and down, and I just couldn't get my feet grounded um, for a long time. And um, somebody told me, said, you, you seem to have classic PTSD. I said, w w what's that? And um, I told them, you know, more about what was going on with me, and they asked me about my service, and they said, you need to talk to somebody. Um, I don't regret for a moment having served, having gone to war, having seen the th things that I, I saw. I've seen children in Vietnam with missing limbs, uh, bodies torn to pieces and brought beyond recognition. As Like in the time we uh, policed up bodies from uh, the ammunition dump that was uh, burned up in, during Tet. Um, because you just don't know. You just say, well, I, I, I would rather have had something else than having that experience. But all those things are what make you who you are later on. And for, good, for better or worse, you just don't know what you would be without those experiences. So to say that you don't want that experience or you wish that it hadn't happened, it's kind of a tough call. Mr. Ward, I'd like to thank you for your service and also for taking the time for the interview today. Thank you. It's my pleasure.